Rikarshan. I am going to review right now Soul Catcher by Dmitry Bortnikov, a, um, a Russian writer who uh, moved to Paris and has been writing in uh, Paris for some years. Um, I meant to do a little bit more uh, uh, work on, on this, but I got the idea for doing the review um, the way I'm going to do it just now. So I'm just jumping into it. It's by Betimes Books. It's uh, something that uh, I recommend to every single reader. Um, so let's get that out of the way right now. Um, the reason I'm doing this the way I'm doing this is because I had decided that with this book, I'm going to have to be a little more um, uh, prepared than I usually am for a review I, I, and, and not do it off the cuff. And I just decided... I got to do this off the cuff. It's, there's just no other way for me to do this uh, book. Um, I'm, I got the idea to start with um, the back of the book, with the blurbs. <clears throat> and I, you'll see why. Uh, blurb number one is uh, this strange novel. Yeah, it's strange. Partly autobiographical. Yes, it is. Is built as a succession of reminiscences and dreamlike images of the steppe, the tundra, and Paris. True. But no matter what the story is, what matters here is the power of his writing, harsh and infused with venomous poetry. I'm not going to do they're, they're French sources, and uh, so um, I'll just, just trust me, that's what it says. And uh, so that's the longest blurb, and it's true. Uh, a modern inferno. That's true enough. Um, it's the kind of thing that you can, you can say, hmm, a modern inferno. So, does, what does that mean? Is it, is it in, in verse? No, but a modern inferno, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. That's that's not not wrong. Uh, dazzlingly inventive. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Um, number four. This sublime text has rhythmic power, incantatory energy, insolent humor. Yeah, that's true. Um, the insolent humor, I think, is in the eye of the beholder. Um, there isn't a, uh, you're not going to be cracking up when you read this book. Um, he's not a knee slapper like Kafka um, or Beckett, um, who have um, perhaps equally, perhaps not quite as bleak a view of, of life as uh, Bortnikov. But um, yeah, when he's funny, it's, it's funny, but he doesn't give you long to enjoy it. Um, so, um, but it's from Le Mans, and I can say Le Mans, uh, Le, Le Mans, so I did. But, um, so that's four blurbs, all correct. Uh, the next one is one word, iconoclastic, true. Better than a novel, a long feverish blues full of ghosts, sorrows, and hungry dogs. Um, now, is it better than a novel? I don't know if they're, I don't think that's what they mean. I think what they, better to describe it, it might be better to say that it's a long feverish blues full of ghosts, sorrows, and hungry dogs. Um, yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good description. Um, it's not anything like um, most novels. I mean, it, it's a complete, it's its own beast. But, it, you know, uh, so, again, we have a very, very, I don't know what they mean by better than a novel, but it, I read it as better described as a long, feverish blues full of ghosts, sorrows, and hungry dogs. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, and then, finally, a masterpiece. Also true. But, you know, that, that's, that's fine. You can, you can look at books and find that they say, accurate things and they say funny things sometimes that are just ridiculous 
a friend of mine today said, uh, uh, I would like to see a blurb that says stunningly pedestrian. And <laughs> so, you know, that, that would be great. Um, that would be great. To, it should be a standard, uh, a stamp should be, you know, uh, stunningly pedestrian. You know, everything that comes across your desk that is, you put stunningly pedestrian. But um, this is not stunningly pedestrian, but it's stunning. Uh, definitely stunning. So, but the, the main thing is you get seven blurbs, not one compares them to another writer. <laughs> and, and that, um, I don't know if that was by design, but it's certainly um, refreshing. And um, I, I had a, um, a writer yesterday, I was thinking, well, maybe he's a little like, uh, I can't even remember who it was, but it wasn't quite true. What is the book about? Well, it, it is a, a, it's a novel enough that I can say that it's about uh, a guy who's uh, Russian, has moved to Paris, and at the beginning of the book, he's uh, recalled to his childhood by the... Um, uh, a phone call from his father that's worth quoting. I was masturbating. This is the opening of the book. I was masturbating when my father phoned. Well, the father, I, I believe, the uh, it's not always clear what is, the action is, but I think it's the same. It was that conversation in which he finds out that his mother died a pretty miserable death. Um, you're not going to get, in this book... Um, play-by-play uh, -play story of any anybody at all. But um, his father, we know, was uh, at war in Finland twice. Um, we know that his mother uh, was simultaneously um, uh, responsible for abortions and deliveries, and uh, um, which is very much uh, um, thematically apt in this book. There's a uh, um, Death is on every page. Probably the word death is on just about every page, if not the dead or the dying or the living who want to be dead. Um, it's, it's a book about that very thin line, and um, uh, I, I'm not sure beside that the reason to call it um, long feverish blues full of ghost sorrows and hungry dogs is that feverish is is the part that that um, is apt here because it 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 you you can't make sense of all of it it's 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 it is uh, poetry and sometimes it's poetry that 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 stuns you like when he says uh, very alive yes very alive. Joyful like seahorses, their hands, and, you know, but he's talking about the hands before, he's talking about the hands at a market, you know, and, and he, he says, at the market, I always avoided the faces, I was only looking at hands, people's hands, thousands, hundreds of hands, all sorts of hands, on pigs' cold heads, fingers on stiff cow's heads, hands, their name is nobody, I love that, um, the page before, there was something I underlined. It says, in a town where every dog knows you. <laughs> I don't know if that was meant to be funny. I'm taking it out of context here. So at the beginning of the book, there I think there are four sections to the book. Um, do I remember that right? Uh, yes. Uh, the first section, he's taken back to his childhood. The second section is the most mystifying to me. Um, he's... In uh, he's from Samara, and I believe he's in Samara, but moved into the city, and uh, he's living with prostitutes and taking care of uh, one of them's child, and so it's like his son, and you know some really lovely stuff uh, about him taking care of the son, but it you know everything around it is grim. The prose is, is extremely grim. The third section is uh, probably the hardest to read because um, 
he's in the uh, military um, at a, a, a time in which it was mandatory and and there was no war, but he was up at the uh, um, the the delta of the Lena River, which means way the fuck up there by a sea that I hadn't heard of before, the Laptev Sea. I didn't look up the brothers, the Laptev brothers, who they were named after. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read everything I underlined here, and so if this takes a while, it's already been ten minutes. Just trust that you're going to get more of him than of me. Um, her art moved even, her eyes almost pissing. Love that. Um, your departure will be timid, Zoya. You will die like a fish, like it's a dormition. Like a child, you will fall asleep in the middle of the party. There, there are lines like that throughout. There, the, he cannot... Um, seem to look at anyone without thinking of their death um and he and on the other hand he cannot look at dead people without thinking of their their um sort of life um i'm not sure i can explain that but at any rate it's long that dawn when the lorries burst open and the smell of blood cold smell jumps into the nostrils the drivers get off, open their fridges. Okay, let me just go on here. Life is so sad, fundamentally, so naked in the eye of the dead, so clear. Family is hell. They are all horrible. Yes, all. Hidden love and cordial hatred. Here's their basic sus sustenance. Who fucks who? No matter. The mother fucked by the son who is fucked by his father, who in turn has been deflowered by some Goliath at the dawn of time. And that moves, sways, vibrates, guzzles lives. It's too serious, all that, too heavy. But for the dead, it's a laugh. Yes, hilarious. <coughs> you see, the dead are alive here, uh, in a sense. For those who are on the other side, it becomes so remote. In this case, he seems to be saying the other side, which we usually refer to as the dead side. It's the live side, um, maybe, to laugh at this all. You have to die first, to croak. Yes, Dim. His name is Dim. He's talking to himself. Pay at the checkout. And then I got a whole page here I think is magnificent. Cosmic boredom, my aunt. She's bored to death. Day after day, she dies of boredom but can't manage to croak. She pretends to die just like she has been pretending to live all her life. I thought about all this cheerfully. That's hard to believe, <clears throat> but he says it, I, I will believe it. I thought about all this cheerfully, disconnected for a while. I shouldn't have. She talks about interesting things. <clears throat> she tells me about the dead, neighbors. Do you remember such and such? She tells me everything. Their agonies, hours, stages, everything, how and where, all the details. She looks younger. All right, I say, let her stack it up. All the sorrows of the world, all the cancers, all the tumors, arthritis, arthrosis, colitis, cystitis, and varicose veins, everything, psoriasis, eczema, from the smallest things to the biggest, to the end, yes, to the very end of pain. All the dead women of the neighborhood in my ears, let them rush in. Even those who didn't know they had lived, all, I open my ears, for them. My aunt, poor girl, let her spill it, let her vomit this life, poor woman, from the bottom of her soul, to scrape the bottom. Let all that sadness stream. Let it flood me, the vomit of life. Let it, <laughs> let, the vomit of life is flooding me. The vomit, the old life of centuries of vomit. Let it rise as vomit. We shall float light as chicken shit. I, she, my father, and the cats, and this room, and all. I'll immerse myself into it like a silent oyster, a wise oyster. So speak to me, aunt. Pounce. Go to the bottom of it. Tell me, my mother, her death and all. I'll, I'm all yours. Let's talk, you and I. <laughs> I guess the second time around, that's funnier than I thought. 
So, you know, we're back to the back of the book. Insolent humor? Yeah, I guess so. It's definitely a book you don't want to uh, read just once. You want to keep it around and, and, and look at what you underlined and more. I love this one. Europe, that lacy soul hearing those battle cries that didn't know where to shit. Now, this is still all within the first section. Now we moved into the second section, and I just don't know at all what to say about it. Um, there are friends, there are people he lives with. Um, and this one's actually not stunningly so, but for, the, for him it's pedestrian, but I underlined it. The worst. I always imagine the worst. That's why I'm such a good prophet. It's cute, um, but it's not his very best. It's so slow, this life here, like a song of a blind, drunk coachman. Good metaphor, okay? And then he, he, he throws out these things that become very mystifying uh, metaphors. Um, gods are resting in this invisible circle, indifferent, stretched out like at the bottom of the ocean. Now, the, the, the bottom of the ocean crept into his... His writing brain at that moment is very inspired. Um, now he opens up the worst section, <clears throat> maybe the best section of the book, but the, the most difficult to read. I'm not a squatty anymore. It's been a long time. But now he's going to talk about being a squatty. Um, and a few pages in, you get this. Bear with him. A dog that had a man as a master can do nothing. Nothing against a man gone mad. Nothing. That's an, that's an interesting, interesting um, setup there. We finished her like barbarians. They were out. They were starving. And it's really tough to read about starving people. We finished her, the dog... Like barbarians, two penknives, boots, and sticks. She wanted to hide. She was too scared. She found a crevice, but no, too small. And then she turned around, yes, to fight the last battle? To, to sell her skin dearly? No, she crawled towards us. Her tail between her legs. Like a pup she crawled, crying. My blood. She was crying. Her eyes. To live. She wanted to live. Live. Mad. We were mad. All. Triple mad. From our rotten souls to our heads. And above. Above. The air and the snow. Everything had gone mad. We plagued everything. And everything we contaminated was watching us. We felt a chill in our stomachs. Afterwards we walked without talking. Without looking at each other. Each was carrying a piece of the flesh of that bitch to gobble up behind the barracks. I don't know how to say death in Yakut. That's the uh, local um, indigenous people. This is in Yakutia. We shit in our pants to keep warm. Warm, yes, to keep the arse warm. We would shit and it would keep us warm, the shit. We would stay like this for a few days covered in shit until shower day. Uh, the, the, the descriptions are, are all pretty grim, but then again, he has insolent humor, so uh, <laughs> this is my, maybe my favorite paragraph in the book. We masturbated sitting on the bonnet of our lorries, on their long muzzles. It was quick, we were fast. Arses warmed by the cooing engines. Ah, yes, it was calm like an endless lullaby. I could see us sitting there, faces up to the sky, legs open wide, in a cooing silence. Prudishness is so unbearable. <laughs> we were born, we were alive, and we wanted to be born again and again. There under that sky, our legs spread wide, screaming, ears blocked up from pleasure, to forget yourself and to be born again. And yes, from when, when you read about what they've endured, for no reason, they're, they're in, a, an, in an army unit. And they're in barracks in, in the most inhospitable place you can imagine. Um, you know, 
forget those those people in jungles having to swat mosquitoes. I mean, you're talking starving, freezing, people going mad. Probably the most uh, um, grotesque part of the of a very grotesque book uh, is the one thing I could spoil. Um, there are two guys who just can't take it anymore, and if you can't take it anymore, you you do whatever weird shit you have to do to get out, and that means you know crazy stuff. That means you cannot function as a soldier anymore. Although they don't really function, they don't do anything. Um, but your way out is to go to the hospital, and from there is jail, and the jail is something that they know they're not going to survive. And he follows uh, the story of two people who get out that way. And um, their death is um, uh, presents you with an image that you'll probably never forget. And uh, I'm not going to ruin it for you. But... Um, I will provide you a little bit more uh, feverish, descriptive blues poetry in a novel of feverish, descriptive blues poetry. Frozen hands, rotten ears, complete disfigurement, but no return, anything but not the prison, the whole death to drink it to the dregs, but no return, anything but not the barracks. I remember those three cut off their black ears, their dead ears, their noses, so that they wouldn't be recognized. The um, cold and the, the um, they buried them in the tundra, the ears and the noses, frostbitten. They buried them in the tundra and then foxes. Yes, they came, those white foxes, in broad daylight. They unburied them. I see them, those three, that want to get out, eating with the sled dogs, fighting for a bone, barking, screaming from the cold, from sorrow, going mad, smearing shit over their faces, roaring, gobbling up frozen head dogs, turds, becoming part of the pack, and at night, howling at night, joining their souls with the choir of the pack. I can still see them. Yeah, you can't stop seeing things. Like fish that go upstream to die, the souls go back towards the light of the nocturnal ocean. You will find that sorrow, the end, on the icy winter sand. You will find it in dim, the author. The sorrow that will make us all reborn, yes, all, just before dying. Oh, Lord, another one. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll skip that one. Uh, one writer that I thought of was um, Fernando Pessoa. And the reason I thought of Pessoa was because my favorite Pessoa poem is, I think it's just called tripe soup, or maybe Oporto soup, I can't remember, but uh, uh, it's just like a, a very simple lament, you know, I ordered tripe soup, and they served it to me cold, and um, I'd like to read the whole poem, it's not very long, but that's basically the part that moves you, I, it's sort of, you know, geez, I just asked for tripe soup, and they served it to me cold, and uh, tripe, you know, <laughs> He says, what a tripe soup it was. Uh, just an exclamation. And a couple more times tripe comes up. So I'm, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, this this is certainly uh, the type of person who would read a lot of um, unusual um, writers. And, you know, if he didn't read Pessoa, it would be pretty surprising. And uh, who doesn't read Pessoa? Um, it's like reading Kafka. Who doesn't read Kafka? So, did did the tripe soup enter into his, you know, uh, sad universe? Um, 
sex. There's a lot, a lot of sex in here, uh, in you know, but generally it's not beautiful. Um, she came with a, sn a strident snore there, as if the devil was trying to stick a flute into a she-wolf's arse. <laughs> it's, it's not the way we, we picture sex, you know. Finally, he ends up in Paris. Yes, Clara. Yes, I'm heavy like a thousand bidets. My ecstasies are jealous. Heavy. I'm a blocked bidet in ecstasy. Now, make what you want of that. Um, but in this book, um, it stands out for the clarity of the bidet, and it fits in for the uh, mysterious way in which he's using it. And I, I can't say that I entirely follow him uh, throughout the book. Um, but let me go on just a little bit more. I know this is very long and so on, but I, I have to do this. Um, you know, he's just talking about people in Paris. You know, you think that the book's going to pick up. He's in Paris now, you know. He's not in the, the tundra anymore. And uh, um, But you never quite grasp what's going on in Paris. He doesn't, say, you know, talk about his friends in an, any linear way, um, his women in any linear way. You get the idea that he's had a marriage and a child, and um, he's deemed too crazy to take care of the child, and yet the most beautiful scene in the book involves him and the child. We'll get to that. And uh, um, <laughs> uh, he's, he's watching... Uh, people. It says, they pick up the scent of fear. The big funk. It's love. I translate. Lubo. Bless you, the arse of youth. The old farts, slobbery, hearts muzzled, are so nice. So squashed. As soon as one had a heart attack, no more fucking crawling in fear. The fear of emptying their balls once and for all. To croak on top of this old, on top of his old woman. Ah, no. So one daydreams then, with a young one. Balls in the pockets, yes, you have to be reasonable. To come under anesthetic. The true old age is when one is happy, but happy to climax without croaking. To empty your balls and find yourself still alive, here's the thing, the rest of it, to hell. The old guys, they know the thing. Desire has no wings. True desire, it crawls. The man smells of the sea when he pulls out of a woman. Melancholy. I remember in Sebastopol, I saw a couple of sailors. They walked arm in arm. The boulevard was empty. The boulevard was white like a bone in the step. It was the South. I knew a guy who fucked corpses. He told me he loved them. He told me he couldn't stand the living. Never could. The dead aren't jealous, he used to say. I knew another one. He was a plumber. He loved sniffing dirty underwear in his customers' homes. He was saying, mm, I plunge my head into the dirty laundry basket and I sniff. He was very nice. Two kids and a wife. That's about as uh, um, uh, conventionally novelistic as he gets. It lasts for a couple paragraphs. Sometimes there are things. It isn't so dead here. Two girls, two friends are walking by. High-heeled girls. Clip-clop. They're walking by like a horse. You'd say a mare in our courtyard. I see them with my ears. Their buttocks are moving. Kitchen sounds, smells. It's coming from down below. It smells good. It smells of life. And then, you know, a uh, couple, let us all, couple, couple paragraphs, and it's let us all croak here, all Kalashnikov to death. Um, is this a, a book that opposes life? Not at all. Not at all. My soul is an old air hostess. <laughs> That's insolently uh, humorous, I think. I, I want to read one more bit because it's just beautiful. Um, uh, I drove west towards my dear mother-in-law's, towards the countryside. Here he's being a little sarcastic or sardonic towards drooling boredom, towards rustic Sundays, disemboweled, stinky. 
And just after that, he goes, I've got a spa treatment of sweetish boredom at the mother-in-law's. I want to climb into a cow's arse to sleep and not to see anything anymore. Um, then there's uh, one other thing that I think of, um, you know, the, the Chagalls with their floating um, characters. Um, and I, I see Chagall a couple of times in this, the, you know, in, uh, uh, cities empty, empty, all destroyed. Carcasses of houses, walls, bones of cities leaked by the fire. I fly over them. Death isn't home. Above the cities under the sun, I fly. It's so slow and no one. The sky, a fainted angel's eye. That, that brings to mind the Chagall flight. But, uh, and there are a couple of those. Uh, and then, the, you know, once in a while you're kind of stopped by, and, and this would be anybody would come up with their own things to underline, but, you know, just a short one. Like fish in a shady spot, my heart stops. I like that. Okay, the bed bugs and the child. And uh, so I'll leave you with something positive, I think. Um, he, he's uh, staying with his son. Maybe his son is visiting him in a, um, you know, in a, a, a very uh, uh, impoverished uh, apartment. It's hard to say. It doesn't really tell you what's going on. Um, he says, okay, they're, they're, uh, ah, you fell asleep like a soldier falling in battle, but it wasn't the end of it, no, bed bugs, they came and I saw them coming one by one like at Noah's, the great embarkation, those relentless daughters of Arabia, bugs from all the deserts in the world, not one was missing from the corridor, the silent bugs of Babylon, so big, and even cockroaches, fat scarabs of Israel, from Ghana, from small Togo, from Libya, from the impenetrable forests of Windy, the light. I leave it on to observe them, bed bugs, those old girls, from all the corners of the world, from the bottom of the sky, from the sea, from the deserts. I have to talk to them. I'm naked. Come over here. On me, not on him. No, not on, not on his son. Don't touch him. Come, I'm here, lying. I wait for you like a virgin awaiting the sacraments. My blood, my old, not so rotten, my blood. Come on, all you can drink. It's good, my blood. Get yourself drunk. Drink standing or lying. Get smashed. But him, don't touch him. He's dreaming. His blood is asleep. It isn't a good moment. It's still too young, his wine. Come on, suck the old one. I have a good flow in my veins. Paint yourself red. Like the demons, Aspel, Anzu, Asmadai, drink yourself to death, become my blood brothers. Come on, the night is yours. Demons from the four corners of the world, here. Shh, no screams. At dawn, they will leave this way, through this window, down this cliff. Demons on the edge of the night, they will throw themselves down. Come on, here, my neck. No, not here, lower. Yes, here it's tender. Good blood. Come on. There's no one. No competition. Quietly. It's night. No one to be here in this misery. A sleeping child and you. You who are offering yourself to the bed bugs as a sacrifice. We're telling them, feast. It is my blood. You, damaged with neither grace nor magic. Soon you'll be old, really old. You will be reading your old age in the eyes of the others. I daydream. It's only a dream, a sick dream of a sick man. It's you, yes, it's really you who's sick. Your kidneys, you will end up pissing sand, all that. This life dim. And then we die. And then we don't move anymore. We can't even chase away a fly that tramples our forehead. Life. We should just keep silent. Keep silent and look into the distance. And so on. And uh, I have no idea quite how to express uh, what this book is. Um, this is uh, the difference between a writer reviewing, perhaps, and a reviewer reviewing. Uh, I'm not embarrassed. Uh, I love this book. It's, a, it's gorgeous. 
um, and uh, it doesn't ruin your life to think about these things. I mean, Bortnikov is, as far as I know, still alive, and uh, and his biography ends with um, on the book ends with uh, that he lives in Paris, where he is a full time writer. So, um, who knows what need he had, how he really views the world. He does have his humor, he has his love, but um, is he talking about the one person's um, uh, damage or the kind of damage that happens throughout the world? Uh, There's the suggestion that I bring to the book already, but is confirmed by the book, that that life is very, very skewed, and um, it's very difficult to escape that. <clears throat> and um, I think one thing that skews it is the simple um, dichotomy that's created by being aware from the beginning or early on that you're going to die, and having an organization of life that in every single um, advanced, so to speak, civilization I know of, that suggests that the fact of death is not incorporated into the organization of life. Uh, That is not explicitly said here, but um, I think it supports that view. This is an extraordinary book, and if I went on uh, too long... For anybody, um, uh, it's because you didn't read this on your own time, and you followed my time. Read it on your own time, in your own time. Take your time. I did. I'm going to be much faster with my next one. But then again, I always think that. Um, It's a a gorgeous book, and um, it was translated by the author working with the um, chief editor of Betimes Books. And um, it's a, 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 a gorgeous book, so obviously beautifully translated. And um, it's the kind of book you, you just, I don't know, either if you don't throw it away after two pages, then you will live with it forever.